Hello, everyone. Welcome back to episode two of Cell Bowl 2021. Yay. We are joined today with my second ever guest on the show, Mr. Carlo Ledesma. Welcome. Thank you for joining Hi. us today. Well, thank you for inviting me here. <laughs> thank you. And so what we're going to cover today are a little bit about his certifications and the program that he is running and the program he is in right now. And um, Mr. Odegaard is going to tell us about that. We're going to talk about um, why do we get different certifications? What can we use them for? Why do we advance our careers by getting more education as well? And what you can really do with all of those sorts of credentials. Then we're going to talk about the stats for the week. There has been an amazing set of changes within the stats. So you all should not go anywhere. This is going to be an amazing episode. And then um, right after that, we're going into a tutorial about uh, red blood cells. So Mr. Odegaard, um, can you tell us a little bit about our guest today? Sure, and welcome. Thank you for having me back again. So Thank you for Carlo Ledesma here. is... Um, uh, definitely one of a kind. He got his bachelor's degree um, in the Philippines at the University of San Tos Thomas. Um, and then he also got has his master's in clinical laboratory science as well. Um, he is certified medical technologist from AMT and from, as a medical laboratory scientist with ACP. And if that's not more than enough. He has a specialty in hematology and he's just gotten his diplomat in laboratory medicine. Um, and currently he's also in a DCLS program. So I don't know when he finds time to sleep, but thank you for joining us. It's very exciting hey, to thank have you, you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Cell Bowl, champ <laughs> the, the Battle of the Champions. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh man, we are so excited to have you and you have a very impressive resume. So can you tell us a little bit about why did you decide to um, get your specialist in hematology certification um, after getting your generalist? So uh, a little bit of background on, on my experience as to how I ended up with a special specialist certification, all the additional letters behind my name. Uh, it all started when, when I worked uh, at a university hospital and I worked in a special heme laboratory. And while I was working there, I went into my master's degree program in clinical lab science. And after I finished, I, I always have this goal, like professional goals. Um, and, and you know every year during my annual evaluation as, a, as an employee, you know, you set up your goals, you set up short-term goals, you set up long-term goals. What I do personally is I set up goals that I think I can achieve <laughs> in a year or a goal that I want to challenge myself to get. Uh, so after that, I, after my program and um, working in special team, I want to show that, you know, I have a good grasp of these, the, 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 the job that I'm doing and, you know, solidifying the, the academic part of it, I wanted to take the specialist certification. So I did that and passed um, one of the toughest exams, by the way. <laughs> um, and, you know, down the road, each, each year I, I do challenge myself again. That's why I always uh, look at that. And it also brings up opportunities in leadership or education or advancement in, in career. So, that's primarily the reason is to solidify or, or show grasp of my technical um, knowledge and also bring opportunities um, to, for me, um, for my career or for advancement or professional, yeah. professional advancement. So, I, I, I definitely, cool. I, yeah, I agree with that. Um, for my specialty, it was the same kind of thing. I wanted to show that I had a good grasp on the knowledge, but um, a good friend of mine also says you want to prepare for the career that you want. So mm -hmm. in the long run, if you, when you look at, I want to be that lab manager or that lab supervisor of hematology or micro, um, the specialty for me um, also helped in that regards to apply for the job for the future that I, I, I want or for teaching as well to show that, you know, I am an expert at micro or in hematology in this case. So yeah, I, I agree, Carla. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So um, we were having a great conversation off um, the air <laughs> before we got started. Um, and so just to clarify, you don't need to have a specialty uh, certification in order to um, reach certain uh, leadership roles. However, as um, Mr. Odegaard Aaron was saying earlier, it does put you uh, part, it sets you apart and gives you a little bit leg up or edge on someone else who maybe hasn't gotten the specialist certification. So it's always something that is really good to consider. It's not necessarily required. It might be in some places. So always make sure that when you are going to set your goals, uh, your educational or your um, career goals, you want to look at current job postings to make sure that what they're requiring is not something that's a surprise to you before you go and want to apply to that. So. You want to always make sure that you're looking ahead, look at the current trends and make sure that you're setting short term goals to get to that long term goal of reaching whatever position it is that you want. So, Carlo, I know that you also have um, ended up going into education like I did. So you're a program director and uh, <laughs> you're also working today um, PRN at a hospital. And so um, it's really exciting to hear about what you're doing. So um, you also are doing the doctorate in laboratory science. And I'm <laughs> like, what are you doing? So um, <laughs> you have all this time somewhere oh, no stashed sweet. in a closet. <laughs> and we would love to know how you're doing that and um, what it is that you're trying to accomplish with um these different uh, programs that you're running and in, like, what is what is your goal here? So I guess, let me give me a, give you a historical background of, of my career. I essentially came from a family of, of medical lab sciences, or we, I started some med tech or medical technologists, what we call them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, uh, fun fact, my first job was a lab assistant in microbiology. Ooh. I was oh, a very nice. lab assistant um, in, in Lakeland, Florida. Wow, <laughs> very cool. um, that, that was my first job. I was a, I was a lab assistant while I was reviewing for my boards uh, uh, when I came over to the United States from the Philippines. So from there, uh, I became a, a medical technologist. And um, if you do you guys remember monster.com <laughs> or, or, yes. or those um, <laughs> resumes? Stuff? That's what, yes. how I ended up in Oklahoma. Oh, um, wow. Uh, so I, uh, because in Florida, I was a licensure state and, you know, I graduated from the Philippines. So a um, uh, hospital recruited me to come over um, uh, in Oklahoma. And that, so my, it was a unique experience for me being uh, in, a, in a smaller hospital, a new grad by myself, a night shift person <laughs> um, uh, doing everything. Uh, right. So, but to me, uh, that was uh, the most and uh, I guess career enriching moment because I get to make decisions on my own, um, you know, fast decisions. And after that, I ended up working or end working um, in at the university hospital where I worked in special hematology. Um, another fun fact was hematology was the least uh, the least favorite <laughs> or least liked subject of myself when I was in school. I never thought I would be a specialist in hematology if you asked me 15 years ago <laughs> um, because I always was scared to call you know you know when you teach you say oh you shouldn't be calling this because that's life-changing don't call blast don't call blast <laughs> or just don't call all the morphologies it, it, it intimidated me to do microscopic work. But now um, learning all about that in, in at the university where I worked in special heme, um, I, I had found a new passion for hematology. And it, it helps when you have a great mentor that that will, you know, guide your career and, and advise you to what path you'll take. Um, so and then after that, I went to master's and then went to um, down the line and went uh, took on, uh, applied and got into the doctor of clinical lab science program um, where, you know, there's, it's, 
I'm a student again. <laughs> so I could tell my students, like, I could empathize. <laughs> I'm a student. Uh, you're my student. So we're all suffering. I'm just kidding. Um, no, but I, I, uh, I, I always, I found, I found a lot more um, passion into the labs. I, it renewed my passion for medical lab science, not just hematology, but, but overall um, the field of, of medical laboratory science. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's for me. This is all I know, <laughs> um, and as you can tell, live and breathe it. But I work um, in addition to being an educator. I, I worked PRN um, at a hospital. Uh, the reason for for myself is to uh, you know keep up with my skills um, skill set um, and keep up with the technology um, so that it's, it's it's it remains relevant. That I'm not just um, you know, teaching, but I, 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 I want to have a feel of the field and, you know, overall feel like not just um, because I want to, <laughs> um, but uh, working in the field and then, you know, teaching, um, it, it puts um, for, my, for my, my, myself, it, it synchronizes what, what I teach. And, you know, as, as a learner too, advancing um, my, my knowledge base and, you know, seeing uh, or, or, or delivering it back again to my students. It's a, it's a full circle. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're, um, you definitely have a way of relating to your students because you're a student now as well. And um, you, know, you are continuing to be able to show and grow with the profession as well as the, um, the new techniques and stuff. So you know, if you do see blast, does that make um, does that make sense in the clinical picture that you right. got um, with what you're seeing with the rest of the results mm -hmm. of the patient, like chemistry and everything? Mm -hmm. And um, how do you relate that to your institutional policies of mm -hmm. when do you call it, um, you know, uh, one plus or whatever, or are you doing, you know, rarely seen or whatever right. kind of deal? So, um, you know, you can you can see a blast and it means something completely life-changing, right. mm -hmm. um, but the way that you report it is a way that is going to affect the care. And so being a DCLS, when you graduate then, you would be the go-between between the lab and the clinician or the doctor on the floor mm -hmm. and saying, hey, you know, in this tough case, we were seeing a minute amount of this um, that means the bone marrow is either being taken over by malignant cells or um, is not producing the cell line because of that. And these are the suggestions of the types of tests to order appropriately. So that goes along with our choosing wisely champions too right. with ASCC. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, you're talking about coming in and being a new program director. And when we were talking off camera too. Um, I had the same issue of, you know, it was very, uh, it was very challenging when I first started as well. I had taught in another program and then took this one over. And, you know, it is nice to have mentorship in order to make sure that you are learning from somebody else's mistakes. And you also have a shoulder to lean on. Um, you can share policies and stuff. And so um, I found that, you know, is the same thing, but I found out and I think a longer version than you did. I was like on my own for a while. Right. But then when I had my site, my NACL site visitors come in, oh man, those ladies were incredible and they were so kind. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, oh, this is a this is a bigger community. The educational community for right. um, clinical laboratory science is very close knit, and we are there to help each other. Right. We are not there to try to close programs. We are there to try to put, raise them up and mm -hmm. um, shoulder the the burden of the manpower shortage. Right. Mm -hmm. So Knuckles has started a program director mentorship. So please, you know, if you are a program director, a new program director coming in, um, we are there for you. And uh, also you have ASCP mentors um, who are also program directors as well, or faculty. I would be one of them myself. Um, 
And so it's good to have um, all these different mentorship um, mm -hmm. possibilities. ACL, um, ASCLS has mentors too now, right, Aaron? Mm -hmm. Oh, they do, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about ASCLS? And mentorship at, at, at ACP, right? Yeah, yeah both, both programs do. Um, I, I just, do. I, the one thing I wanted to add real quick is um, I, I can relate to Carlo with um, when I took my test, micro was not my favorite. Um, and <laughs> uh, it is having those good mentors. Um, yeah, so that was not my favorite. And now I absolutely love micro. Um, I can't see myself doing anything other than micro. So it's amazing what having good <laughs> mentors can do. Right. Um, and I love the fact DCLS is an amazing thing at this point. I love that you're a part of that because it is, it's um, bridging the gap that mm -hmm. we're here for our patients. And it's a, it's a role that's needed to be filled. But so we're a diagnostic team and that's the piece that was missing. So it's cool that you right. get to kind of be a trailblazer and be a part of the first group of people to have good impacts for our patients or even better. Right. So it's, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, you know, like for me, I've always, I've always said that having a good mentor will, will help your career tremendously and it will help out you know, draw your plan because we always like to reach for the stars or at least most of us do. Mm -hmm. But um, it's nice to have that person, you know, straighten you or guide you to, to, your, to the right path. Um, for those who are just starting their careers, you know, we always like, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. Or for those who are just graduating, what can I do with my career or where should I go? You know, other than your, your faculty or your program, uh, program uh, officials, um, you know, once you're doing your clinicals, um, you know, talk to your trainers or talk to your uh, clinical instructors. They, they could, you know, they've been there for years um, and they could, you know, provide some input on, hey, you should do this. You know, they, they're, they're the ones who are um, adept or, or know what's the trend in, in, in the field. So if you're, if you're in that capacity right now, ask them. Um, and, and maybe they'll, you know, lead you to the right path of, of where your career would take you. Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid to <laughs> ask anything. All people can say is no. So be bold and be brave. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And it's, it's really weird because just hearing the three of us talk, um, we, especially you two, um, saying that that wasn't even what you were really liking about the lab. And that's where you ended up going and being a specialist. Um, when you get into the laboratory, that's not where you always end up. There are so many mm -hmm. different avenues that you can take. And really, it's not even always something that you would think of. So even the people that work with the LIS they were laboratorians also, but they also are really good with computers. I never thought I would have a show on the internet. <laughs> I never thought I would be making clothes like what I'm wearing right now. So it's just, it's just something that you kind of either fall into or get guided into um, just by your experiences and the relationships with others. So build those relationships, ask questions, as Aaron was saying and Carlo were saying. Questions are what lead you to those secret opportunities that you didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you never know where you're going to end up. So it's really, really great, this conversation. So thank and, you yeah. both. One additional thing that I, I want to add is being professionally involved. Um, you don't have to be, you know, over there being a leader. You, you, what you, uh, my advice for students, or at least those who are starting their careers is, to get yourself involved with the professional organizations Absolutely. because you know you may not be in a leadership capacity but you are hearing the current trends or what's affecting our profession in general and there are people out there who are leaders that could help you with your career um, you know what do they do and they're always there or they you could find mentorship in them in with them and and maybe you could by do, in doing so, you could give back to the next generation of lab professionals, so. Absolutely, so membership is free for students with ASCP. Uh, you get so many wonderful benefits from there. Um, we were talking about that last week with um, the opportunity to have study materials for the BOC. 
You also have free registration for the ASCP annual meeting that is happening the 20, was it 27th through the 29th? Is that correct, Aaron? You are correct. Boston. And, it's, okay. and, and oh we're yeah, in the, the path of Boston too. We're Boston. in the path of Boston right now. We have um, career coaching that's happening. We have um, mentors, um, ASCP mentors that are offering meetings, three, 30 second, yeah, not 30 second, 30 minute meetings. Um, they can either be a mock interview or they can be a mentor meeting. So just because you're a student and you're looking to move forward doesn't mean you can't have a mentor because you are the next generation of the laboratory and we are absolutely thrilled to have you. So please come get a mock interview session, get a mentorship session. It could just be asking questions. It doesn't mean that you have to have a relationship mm -hmm. with this mentor um, afterwards. And uh, one thing you, uh, I wanted to add is the if you're a member of the professional organizations, uh, if you if you're not the engaging uh, conversation type of person, you get the emails or or list served from ASCLS from ASCP, notifying you of the current trends, um, you know laws that are affecting our profession, or if there is a um, you know we need your help to voice out on an issue. Uh, so you know those those kind of stuff and. Um, about what you said, uh, Tiffany, uh, uh, you will never know who, who you're talking to. Um, for me, um, I, uh, I, I gave a lecture at one point, I guess five years ago, and I got, got an email recently that mentioned, I, uh, I don't know, I don't think you know me, but I attended one of your lectures and it inspired me to become a hematology specialist. I just took my specialty, specialty certification and I passed. So like, oh, you know, that was a, that was a great moment, you know, uh, um, that you never know who you're gonna touch. So if you are that kind of person in the, in, in the lab, whether you're an experience or just starting out, don't forget to reach out because we are, um, we're here as a profession and we know what it, uh, for us who are, who are educators, who are in the bench, um, we know that we need you guys. <laughs> we need uh, the, the guys to excel in our profession, especially this time of our lives. Um, mm -hmm. we, need, we need you guys more than anything, and we need you to influence the others to come join us. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, so we do have, uh, for student membership in ASCP, we do have... Um, magazines that you get, which will talk about certain things that are maybe trending or uh, even case studies of current um, issues. We've had stuff about COVID, we've had stuff about leukemia, we've had stuff about everything. And so uh, you can even reach out to the people who are the authors on those case studies and you can meet them at the mm -hmm. virtual meeting or the annual meeting in person. So Lots of opportunities. There's posters there as well. Aaron, did you want to talk about the annual meeting at all? Uh, you've touched on the fact that, I mean, it's, it's a free opportunity for students to attend. So that's a great benefit. Um, career services, get those practical things, um, get someone to look at your resume, um, get the tips you need. Learning is going to be free and uh, just don't be afraid to ask questions. So I completely agree with everything you said. Um, and uh, just take advantage of the opportunities you have. Absolutely. You never know where they're going to lead you. They could lead you to become a microbiology specialist or hematology specialist <laughs> <laughs> or a famous lab YouTube star. Oh, with yeah, I, there you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so you never know. Uh, those are my, Long story my words there. of wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You all are getting more certifications. I'm like, I could do my job better. Let me take videos. <laughs> That's yeah. how that all got started. It wasn't even anything um, that was supposed to be this big, but I'm so glad that it is. So thank you all for watching. I'm very appreciative. And uh, we all are actually. So we're going to go ahead and get started with okay. the um, presentation of the stats. So, so Tiffany, get excited. What? <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> Are you ready for some silver? <laughs> yes, it's going to be a blast. Woo! Be a blast. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Okay, so we have had a lot of craziness because this is the wrong screen to share. 
Holy moly. All right. It's the same presentation. It's just the wrong one. Um, oh, no. Some technical difficulties. I guess that's right. We're getting there. I guess that's right. I just didn't have it in presentation mode anymore. Um, so sorry. Take a second. There, there we are. All right. So um, globally, um, so this is our week in a snapshot. So just like we did last week, we have the top runners of each category or each region. Um, we have the West, the Midwest, and the East. But I wanted to touch on global uh, statistics right now. Right now, we only have three, uh, 33 respond, uh, responses, sorry. Um, and they're from the US. So if you all are out there, you're in Africa, you're in India, Indonesia, the Philippines, Please, I know that you all are out there watching this stuff because- Philippines um, need to represent. Yes, I have <laughs> friends at USF in the Philippines. They have been um, watching my videos for years now and uh, having a study group and you know, really being good fans and having uh, a great opportunity to engage with me and the profession. So I know you all are out there doing this competition too. Don't let the US take it, you know? We want you to be involved as well. You have the opportunity of winning great lab swag, like um, this mug that we've got what? right here. Look at that cup. Yeah. And then, <laughs> um, we also have this fanny pack. So if you're doing an awesome job with being a hematology hero, you need to be sporting this and showing everybody how awesome you are. Okay. Bring so, fanny pack back. Absolutely. And they are back with a vengeance. Let me tell you, men are wearing them, back to the across <laughs> themselves and wearing them across, going over the shoulder. You can wear them any way you want, but it's a great way to carry anything, even like a water. If you have, you know, everybody's carrying their water bottles around, um, you can even put them in that. So uh, it's whatever you want to do, but we want to make sure that you're actively engaged. So if you have that perfect score, that's beating my time then absolutely make sure that you are submitting into that online form, which you can find uh, in the description of the rules video, the first video before the episodes have gotten started. I can uh, put that in the description of this video as well. So please make sure you're um, engaging and we wanna hear from you as well. All right, so um, Carlo, do you wanna do the West? We've got the... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Zooming in for a little bit. Yeah. Zoom Thank in you very much. so we get a closer look <laughs> at the stats of the week. So we have um, the um, touchdown for the week highlighted in yellow. Take it away, Carlo. It, it looks like the um, Beaver State has decreased uh, 7.2 seconds. Uh, and Cell lines that have trouble, um, let's see here, lymphoblast, plasma cell, micro microcardiocyte, um, and UCD in uh, Sacramento. Um, look at that, um, just 0.3 seconds. Um, but plasma cells, uh, Portland Community College um, has difficulty with myeloblast. Um, but they have uh, overall score of 29. Um, those look like... <laughs> Crazy. That's really great. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. Crazy. Um, <laughs> um, so what we have here is we've got Weber State leading the pack throughout the entire week again. Um, we'll see selfies at um, in the next uh, couple of slides here, but they are really carrying us this week again. And they are. So 26 they had, seconds. Yeah, they had a score last week that topped the charts also. And then they decided, hey, that wasn't good enough. I'm going to decrease that time that it took me to identify those 30 cells by 7.2 seconds. Those cells are making me look so bad. <laughs> less, than, less than a second in a few of those cells. <laughs> That's yeah. incredible. I don't that know how they're doing it. Um, so yeah. I am, I'm going to put the challenge out there because I think that this could happen. I don't think it's physically possible and humanly possible to get 30 cells done in 20 seconds, but Weber state, I'm challenging well, you to make that happen. Less right. 
<laughs> I just thought let's, I'd get that in there because let's, let's, I'm really excited about this. <laughs> maybe we could set not just a, a, a yeah. selfie record, but maybe this is going to be the Guinness Book of World Records. I think <laughs> so. I am so no. impressed. <laughs> Throw down the cell gauntlet. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if you're out drop. there, right, I want to hear challenge accepted. <laughs> Uh, even if you want to do that in a video and upload it as your selfie for the right. week next week, if you make that happen, oh my gosh, we're going to do something special for you. Okay. So there were only three, <laughs> only three the, the, programs out of the seven that signed up in the West that have been competing again this week. So if you are out there and you haven't um, stepped up and put your stuff in there, please make sure that you're going to come on with a vengeance because when we look at the next two regions, um, the next two leagues, you're going to see that people that didn't play last week, they didn't make it to their regional stadium. They came to play this week. Aaron, can you tell us about the Midwest? And oh, what's you know I can. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, I can I see one of my buddies, her, her uh, school's moving on up. So uh, currently UT Health in San Antonio um, has had a time drop of 22 seconds. That's insane. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty good with my lymphoblasts. So I, those are line. I feel good. I, I feel good about that. But I am so proud of my friend Marissa James and her program at University of Kansas Medical Center. They are killing it. Ooh. They're in the second spot. Go, go Marissa. Um, and their time Thank has you. dropped by 19.5 seconds. Shot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's anybody's game at this point um but the standings are going up and down and even look at houston uh, methodist hospital their mls program they're still on the hunt perfect score. perfect score i'm still working on that um st paul college in minnesota you got to watch out for minnesota that they, they uh, kind of can be a dark horse some of their programs so they're still on the hunt and even um and Southeastern Community College, Nebraska, you're still hanging in there. So we're in week two. This is the time to put up a good fight. Um, but no, it's no. incredible. You guys are doing great. So and we it's, had, go ahead, yeah, sorry. 20 out of 30 programs. So let's get that number up. It's yeah, not too late. Had, <laughs> no, it's not, it's not too late. So you're gonna see next to, um, the name of the college program or the institutional program, you're going to see the number of where they were last week. And now you can see where they are in the standings this week. So we're only posting in this each episode, we're only posting the top 10. However, the main stats, the full stats are going out on the medical lab lady G Twitter account. Um, and they're also going out in the community tab of the Medical Lab Lady Gail YouTube channel. So make sure to stay tuned and check those postings out because they'll show you the entire packet. So I have a whole packet full of statistics that I'm running of every single program. So yes. if you had a zero next to your institution, like can Kiki here, um, it's their first play this week. And so they came to win. They came in with 43.3 seconds on their first play in this entire season and they stomped out i'm sorry i don't want to be mean or anything but they <laughs> they like they yeah, took southeast community college for a run right so we're gonna make sure that um we get some vengeance next week right southeast oh. you're gonna bring it back so they were know. number two last week. Okay. They're in number nine. So let's we're bring it get, back up. We're going to get through, right? KU, we're going to get KU up there. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we got some good Rulo. We got some good stacking here. We do. And um, Rulo comes us. from lots of protein. So you better be working it, ladies and gentlemen. Get that we, protein right. power. Right. Work your brain and your fingers. Be like <laughs> Weber State. <laughs> get in there. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So <laughs> I am really just excited about this stuff. So if I'm being too silly, let me know. All right. We're stacking it like Rulo. That's right. But we want, <laughs> but we want to clump like a glutenate. That's right. We want to be. Right. <laughs> we want to be supportive of each other, right? So you want to yeah. clump in a, a, a cold glutenate. 
<laughs> All right. But don't so... fall out and lies. Don't fall out and lies. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So we want to raise our hematocrit, right? right? Raise it right. up. That's right. All right. So in the East, leading the charge is Bowling, Green State University. They were number three last week and they dropped the mic with 23.1 seconds of a lead and dropped it down to 32.77 seconds. So they are the ones to look out for in the East right now. All right. They were three last week and now they're number one. So anybody can bring it up just like University of West Florida. I know we've got some love in the studio for this. Yeah, there we go. Um, celebration over there. And College of Southern Maryland is leading um, right behind them, which they did last week too. So these two teams are neck and neck. All you right? gotta watch got, out for University of West Florida. That's right. So <laughs> University of West Florida score. had a perfect mm -hmm. score last mm -hmm. week, but they dropped it almost a half a minute this week. So we are very proud of them. They were eight last week and they have moved it up to number two. And oh, yeah. following right on their tails, is my favorite, College of Southern Maryland. They are coming up from number nine, making it to number three this week. So um, we, are, we are bringing it back. All right, it was our first perfect score this week with 35.46 seconds. Um, our, our team was out for blood for Weber State this week. And mm -hmm. they asked me, all right, what was Weber's time? We're gonna be 26 back. seconds. Oh yeah, seconds. it was um, last week, it was 33.99. And my students were like, all right, we're gonna get that. And they beat that last week, but Ooh. we didn't know Weaver was coming with 26. What? Coming in hot. <laughs> coming in hot, oh my goodness. Coming in so, hot. Oh, 35, we had 35, not 33. That was West Florida, sorry about that. So we, oh, were, that's right. <laughs> we were running low behind them by two seconds. So um, yeah, West Florida came in and did that. They were like, we've got you, Weber, but now Weber is heading us all out again. So remember, at week four, it is the average of your four weeks that moves you into week five. So you have to be the top two in order to move into week five in your region, all right? And that's your average, that's not your week four. So if you're one of these ones like UMass who just came in and did their first play this week, very impressive, perfect very score well. with 40.17 seconds, you gotta realize you have a zero from last week because you didn't submit. So it is, it is statistics as we were talking about off camera. We, you don't throw out your QC, even though it may not be good QC, you can't throw out those stats. So make sure you're absolutely submitting. And if you are getting that perfect score, bring it back to that global, um, that global competition. Your program director or faculty does not need to submit for you. This is all individual play. So you stand up for your score and you show us who you are. All right, you'll be entered to awesome. win. Whoops, you'll be entered to win all that um, medical lab lady gill swag. Okay, so taking it down to number four, this Mercer Community College or County Community College. I have a friend who runs that uh, program, and uh, it was their first perfect score this week, and they were just edged out last week by being at number eleven, and now they have made it on the board. So they are number four. UMass came in with a vengeance, like we said, they didn't play last week, but they got it and they are right in the middle um, of the standings of the top 10. We're followed by Piedmont and Farmingdale. West Virginia was number one last week, but we all came and we got you. So come on, bring it back to number one. We love your scores. You've been doing perfect scores and you've been getting better as you're going along. So keep it going. And then we've got AHN St. Vincent School and Wayne State um, rounding out the East with Pennsylvania and Michigan with perfect scores too. If you notice, we've got perfect scores only on the leaderboards of the top tens here. Um, so you got to make sure that you are bringing it and bringing it for good. Any um, Anything you all want to say? 
Yeah. There's some tough competition here. It is. Um, there it is. <laughs> I'm getting a little riled up. <laughs> <laughs> but that that presents a challenge to to other people out there. It's not too late and, and be the first uh, college or first program to show that bragging rights of sailboat. Take that sailboat belt. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, you see just in this um, alone, you see four different programs that came in for the first play this week. They made it to the stadium, but they weren't there last week and they made the top 10. It is anybody's game right now. We're seeing all sorts of shifts going on. That's right. Shift to the left, shift to the right, shift down the middle, up to the front. We've got it all happening. <laughs> you got to dodge, you got to weave. <laughs> we do. You got to count those cells. That's right. <laughs> and you got to get in there. And if you are getting too wound up like me right now, I'm hyperventilating. Um, one of <laughs> our, <laughs> one of our um, gifts that we're given for the perfect score um, game is a hematology here, a yoga mat, yoga mat. So if you need to calm down, like I need to do right now, feel free <laughs> to put your score in there and you might win a yoga mat uh, where you can, you know, get your mind into focus while you're looking at cells and working out at the same time. Well, so wellness is important. That is right. And, and you've health. got to center. Yep. Got to yeah. center it all. You all do. right. Are you so, ready to take us to the bench, Tiffany? I am. Carlo, you are going to be our first reporter from the bench. Okay, you ready? <laughs> all right, take it. <laughs> <laughs> we are so, talking about the red cells today and, um, uh, Carlo, if you want to take a little bit, a couple of sections, you want to talk about structure and function of the red cell? Oh, uh, yeah, I can, I can talk about that. So it, red cells, uh, the mature one, uh, matures are anucleated cells, meaning when you look at them, there's nothing in the middle. Um, they're highly flexible biconcave discs. Uh, it's due because there's a network of internal structural proteins and they contain hemoglobin in the cytoplasm. So that's the central pallor, some of us want to call it, but I, I, I like to think of it as a donut, like a donut, because I'm always referring things to food. <laughs> <laughs> Very delicious, <laughs> full of oxygen. <laughs> right, full of oxygen, but you don't want it to be too big. <laughs> uh, uh, the transmembrane proteins uh, identify blood type as a cell and keeps the cell viable and, and most abundant cellular portion of the blood giving it a red color. That's why it's called red blood cell. Um, the function, of course, as we know, is to deliver oxygen from the lungs to the tissues, removes carbon dioxide waste from tissues and brings it back to the lungs for exhalation, maintains acid-base balance of the blood and the lack of nucleus and the flexible structure allows the RBCs to enter small uh, small vessels to deliver oxygen and to remove carbon dioxide. You guys want to add anything to that? I do. Uh, I really do. Because we were talking about yoga. <laughs> <And> <laughs> when I talk about the red cells, I'm going to tell you they're my favorite blood cell because the white blood cells, they're like the showy ones that everybody talks about, but nobody ever talks about red cells. And they are the workhorses of the blood. Mm -hmm. They make sure that your body is functioning appropriately by giving those nutrients to the tissues and taking away waste. Nobody really thinks about CO2 being waste, but it is, and it's a um, dissolved gas, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we have that, staying and um, remaining in the tissues, we end up with this really acidic environment and the um, glycolysis is not going to necessarily be um, uh, helping out in that regard because there's acids that are produced after glycolysis also. So mm -hmm. these cells are um, respirating, they're metabolizing the nutrients and they're making sure that your body is able to function. You lose function when you don't have those red cells bringing what is needed and taking away what is not needed. Okay, so we've got, um, we've got red blood cells that have um, this ability to alter the acid-base balance of the um, blood in two different ways. They pull CO2 out of those tissues and deliver them to the, um, the lungs and they have to be in each of these situations they have to be as carlo was saying 
very, very flexible in order to get into these really tiny vessels. So mm-hmm. that's where this yoga idea comes in because um, they got rid of their nucleus in order just to focus on flexibility and carrying capacity. So that's why their lifespan is only 120 days because they've lost or are losing the um, little uh, organelles that are inside of their cytoplasm to uh, use energy. So they're just using glycolysis themselves but they're able to bring in and, um, sorry, bring in and take out or push out the different types of um, molecules that are involved in acid-base balance. This is my favorite part to talk about in chemistry. That's why I really wanted to talk about it. Um, and, and in the process of doing that, when, when they're in that really small vessel, Um, they're going like single file, right? Because if you think about the vessel they're in, the vessel wall is very thin, okay? So in order for nutrients to get into the cells of the organs that it's delivering it to, there needs to be a thin layer of the squamous epithelium, right? In order for it either to go in between the intracellular spaces of the lining cells or to go through the cells. So anytime you see any type of organ, it's going to have, it's going to be very vascularized because there needs to be nutritional exchange, but there also needs to be waste exchange. So we have gaseous waste, we have physical waste of solid, um, and we have liquid waste. So you're thinking expiration of your lungs, you're thinking um, feces coming out of your intestines, and you're thinking urine out of your kidneys. And all of those have an interface with your blood and your circulatory system. So just because um, you know there is food and then you end up seeing feces, it doesn't mean that there wasn't any exchange with the blood, okay? So um, we're talking about these amazing cells that are able to carry all of this into very harsh environments, okay? Mm -hmm. So the more that they're in the harsh environments, the more, um, you know, breakdown is possible and the more stress that is on their membrane. So when we look at how, um, how we are seeing those red cells within the circulation, they're constantly passing through the like airport security in the spleen, right? right? And those macrophages are just watching them like airport security and like, hey, you might need to be taken out um, of circulation soon because you're like, (laughs) You're, you're looking a little suspicious, yeah. like you're not able to do your job very well anymore. I, I want to add to that. Like I always say uh, the spleen, in, in addition to this, there's a security, uh, I, I call it car wash. Like make sure you're clean before you go back. That's right. Uh, so you drive around there. So do you want to talk about how they do that in erythropoiesis, Carla? Yeah, that's a good segue here. Um, In erythropoiesis, uh, how red cells are produced is based on a feedback mechanism that controls the RBC production by the bone marrow. So where does it all start or what triggers the formation of red cells? Uh, What triggers the formation of red cells is usually hypoxic conditions or low oxygen levels. um, And it triggers the production of one hormone called erythropoietin, which is, you know, in in lab terms, you'll hear it, EPO, um, EPO. um, And the erythropoietin is um, produced um, in the kidneys. So erythropoietin um, stimulates the bone marrow to produce RBCs from pluri potent stem cells. So it's, it's like, I, I like to think of it as a trigger and tells, uh, wakes the bone marrow, hey, dude, wake up. We need more of you. We need more of you, come out. <laughs> come out here, we need you. Um, uh, and immature RBCs or, or the blast form of the RBCs mature and replicate in the bone marrow and the newly anucleate cells go to the spleen for processing and their lifespan goes to 120 days. And in circulation, sorry, um, 
when there's a demand, of course, the um, bone marrow will form the red cells um, when there's an increased oxygen demand. So I said, hypoxic conditions trigger the formation of, of red cells. So if you find yourself uh, traveling or uh, um, mountain climbing, <laughs> uh, you'll find that you need more oxygen um, or when you're hyperventilating, <laughs> uh, you need more red cells. So the, your kidneys will tell or will produce EPO tell uh, your, your bone marrow to, to make more red cells or release more red cells. So that's uh, the production part of erythropoiesis. Um, guys want to add more to that or do you have any more? I was just trying to help you out with zooming in on the cells oh. here too. Um, so yeah, as you were saying, you've got those pluripotent stem cells, right? And whatever cytokines or interleukins are present, um, mm -hmm. knowing the needs of the body, they're saying, hey, we need more red cells or, hey, we need more of myeloid line, you know, mm -hmm. more granulocytes or whatnot. Um, so you have all these possibilities that could end up um, causing the, the reason for needing um, red cell production. So as you were saying, oxygen demand, if you're, if you're doing a highly strenuous exercise, um, mm -hmm. or you're going to the gym like Aaron's doing all the time now mm -hmm. and you're building those muscles, <laughs> okay, building yeah. those muscles, <laughs> That's right. building those muscles, he's going to need more oxygen, right? To feed those muscles mm -hmm. so that they can keep on trucking. And, um, so there may be an increase in need of that, but it's not necessarily mm -hmm. a disease process, right? Whereas if you have some kind of destruction of red cells, you're red gonna cells. notice that you're gonna have um, what may Our be cells. considered a uh, uh, hemolytic anemia. It all depends on what it is. So when we talk about um, hemolytic anemias, we're talking about the primary reason why right. there is mm -hmm. anemia is because of hemolysis, where they all might have a hemolytic component. It may not be the primary reason for right. the lack of red cells. So when we talk about anemia, anemia, if you break down the word, A in Latin is lack of, and then emia means blood. So lack of blood. And we know blood is red, as Carlo was saying, because of the red blood cells. And that's, they're red because of hemoglobin. So when we go through this chart, we're gonna talk about, you know, how, when is hemoglobin starting to be produced? Why that changes the cytoplasm look of it? When we lose the nucleus, how all that relates to what it's doing and what you see in the peripheral blood. Um, but with, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with a hemolytic anemia, it could be that there is a um, challenge on the immune system. It could have been that the patient was recently transfused with some type of blood product, um, like packed RBCs, right? And if the body doesn't see that as um, we, Carlo was talking up here about the self transmembrane proteins, like your blood type, um, they're going to be marked for destruction. So you'll end up with, it could be, <laughs> looking at Carlos, he's, <laughs> But I'm not, not Carlos. He's, I'm looking at Aaron. He's making faces. Um, it could be that you see non-self and they're, they're marked for destruction. And then you end up with a hemolytic event, right? Like an acute hem hemolytic mm -hmm. transfusion reaction. And so what we started out as trying to do with treating a patient with anemia, trying to help them um, to meet that oxygen need in their body. Now we've created even worse of a problem because we didn't give them the appropriate uh, blood type or they had an antibody we didn't identify in blood banking when we were doing that testing. So um, there are ways that hematology and blood banking work together in order to figure out what is the appropriate um, strategy to help this patient, right? So, um, um, in a, in a, uh, just wanted to add about the role and the function of red cells. Um, you know, we've talked about the production and how the kidneys, uh, but through erythropoietin will trigger uh, red cell production. Um, but um, 
one thing for me with red cells is I, I appreciate them as much as the white cells because the white cells are the ones that are pretty and like they always have the certain uh, characteristics with them. But red cells would give you clues as we get to the reviews later. It could tell you clues as what Tiffany has mentioned as to what disorder or underlying disorders are there based on their size, based on their shape. Um, I always I always tell them my favorite, my favorite one is the the, the teardrop cells is, is what I call them uh, or the dacrocyte is my favorite of all because it gives us clues um, as to what's going on because it's produced in the bone marrow. Um, you could tell just by the shape of the red cells or as by the size of the red cells, it could give us clues as to what's going on. So um, that's an important thing with red cell morphology and and why we're studying all of them. So. Absolutely. Um, I felt like there was something I wanted to say and I can't remember what it was now. Um, I was listening so intently, um, but you don't, you don't need to say you love red cells as much as I do. I know everybody doesn't love them as much as I do, but I do because I talk about them all the time and every single course that I, I cover, you know, whether it's micro or chemistry or blood banking. And um, so just because you're not in hematology, well, mm -hmm. not because you're in hematology and um, it doesn't mean that you have to not know this stuff, okay? So right. whenever you are in even blood banking, um, you can check the MCV of the patient before you transfuse them um, or vice versa. If the person is working in hematology and they're like, whoa, the MCV just changed really drastically. That either means it's the wrong person or it means mm -hmm. that they just got transfused. All right? right. So when we talk about the auto control and blood bank testing, just because it says auto control it only means that it's whatever is circulating in the patient's blood. So it could be somebody else's red cells in there too. So you see a dual population in hematology and you mm -hmm. also see um, a, an antibody possibly being formed. So auto control <laughs> is not just autoantibody, it's alloantibodies too. Right. So please don't make that um, indication. Oh. That's oh, what yeah. I was going to say. You no, know, um, even even the Tiffany, even the red cells in micro, the the mm -hmm. size of them when we're looking at different plasmodias, different malarias, right, give us right, yeah. so um, gives us tons of. We're all interconnected. That's yeah, the cool absolutely. thing the, about the, that's what I, Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is you know the findings in the red cells could trigger a whole um, the the sequelae or, or, or the um, whole lab coming together because low hemoglobin will trigger a blood bank. Uh, yeah you know, uh, low platelet will trigger a blood bank. And then a consult from hemonc, if it's idiopathic or unknown, uh, we'll need to find out, you know, if they're hemolyzing, uh, mm -hmm. then we'll start looking at the LDH, you know, the, the hem hemolytic markers. Mm -hmm. um, and if a patient is um, paroxysmal nocturnal and has travel history, Aaron, oh, malaria uh, or, or bloodborne parasites. So the plasmodias, so. There's that's a why lot we of love things. having you here, Carlo. You are just the glue that's holding this together today. <laughs> yes. Ties us all together. That's awesome. Yep. So you're talking about chemistry, looking even just at the regular CMP. You've got Billy Rubin in there. If they're mm -hmm. ordering those iron um, study panels and stuff to see mm -hmm. what's right. going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of that stuff is interrelated, even in the urine. You, yeah. you know, you see um, yeah. Billy Rubin in the urine, possibly, or it's you were going to say that, something. What were you going to say? You're getting excited. PCOS training. <laughs> I got excited, too. I got excited. <laughs> Go ahead, Aaron. Are you going to say something? Oh, no. no. I was just going to say it's all the uh, DCLS training. That's right. <laughs> no, That's but, right. Um, I, I wanted to say something, like, an experience of mine, um, because, you know, I, I did work in special heme, so I always um, I did a lot of... Um, uh, work with the cancer patients or, or the, the cancer smears. But one thing that I, um, you know, was taught to me by a mentor and they applied it and, and translated it to training other people was the finding of the teardrop cells. So that's always, I have said, it's an alarming finding. So uh, for the new guys there, if you guys see teardrop cells, 
um, you know, that's a big clue of something is going on. Um, but for me, what I always do, and, when it's, and as far as red cell morphology, is make sense of it all. Um, you do a collective, uh, when you look at red cells, you don't want to just randomly report everything that you find, right? You have to make sense of it. But where I'm going here is the teardrop cells. And, and that's very, very important to find is because if you see a great teardrop cells um, or a number of teardrop cells around um, and uh, you have low white count or low platelet, that to me is a sign that the bone marrow is packed with something, you know, um, it's uh, packed with tumor or malignancy. Um, and that is an important finding. I always say that I say this because there has been some instances where patients would come to the ER with you know infection or fever, um, and then when you see it, low platelets, uh, uh, low platelets, you know they need transfusion or low hemoglobin. But I um, I would immediately report a finding of teardrops as a significant finding, and I what, what I translate this to when I teach or train people is that. That's us holding the hand of a doctor and tell them, go here. Now they're walking in blindly. They don't know where, what's going on, but we know what's going on. But it's the, essentially for me, I say it, that the bone marrow is crying and telling, I need help, help me. So that tells us to really to report it and hold the doctor's hand and go. Tell him there's something wrong in the bone marrow. So it's the bone marrow is crying. It's true. Yes, <laughs> it's crying. Yeah, because when it's pushed, you know, pushed uh, to the the sinuses, it makes a teardrop shape. So that's what I was going to uh, ask you. I was like, can you please talk about why it's done that way? <laughs> so, uh, so how well, how does it form as a teardrop? Uh, teardrop form. Uh, you know, the bone marrow space um, is where the hematopoietic cells are produced. Um, but when there is a tumor or, or a fibroid or fiber takeover of the bone marrow, the erythrons or erythroid islands, so what I call uh, erythroid islands, as some of us call it, um, are being pushed to the sides of the bone marrow sinuses. And when they're pushed, uh, when, they, when the red cells are ready, they, you know, imagine yourself being pushed, you're squeezed out. <laughs> um, you're squeezed out and, and that's what they retain as a shape, they're, they're teardrop shape. But you know, that they retain that tear or crying shape in circulation. So if you, the tech finds that, you know, correlated with information like low platelets and you know, low white count, and you know, we need to report it. So those clues are very, very important. You know, we are the investigators. So we're going to talk about the bone marrow too, and how all of the um, how all of the cells are formed and everything. Because as you were saying, when you have um, the red cells coming out of the bone marrow, they're losing their nucleus right before they come out, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's shifting internally. The proteins and everything are shifting the nucleus over to one side. So it's kind of like squeezed out, right? Mm -hmm. And is that why you're saying the teardrop stays that way? Like there's internal protein structure that's changing? Some, yes, or um, if, there, if, if in the event of a tumor or fibrin where it's taking over the bone marrow space, it pushes those islands out, um, mm -hmm. erythroid producing uh, islands to the sinuses. And when they're produced, they're producing teardrop shapes. And that's how I, I, I see them. So. so the islands he's talking about are um, this very um, metabolically active area of the bone marrow where the red cells are being produced. And there's this, um, they're really, I love these things. They've got mm -hmm. um, macrophages there. So mm -hmm. once the nucleus comes out, they just eat it up and then they spread all the stuff that's inside of it um, around and recycle it in order to remake more cells. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's like a snack bar. It's, <laughs> it's, a snack like a bar. Bar. See? it's, it's all snack. about the food. Donuts, snack bars. Food. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, a, a general rule, I guess, in mat the maturation sequence is, um, you know, as cells, as red cells mature, they become smaller. So the larger they are, um, the more immature they are. And of course, there's nucleus. But as they mature, following the sequence of erythropoiesis, they become smaller. So, so we are going to talk about that too. Um, and we're going to relate it to the automated CBC. 
and the smear review. So do you, um, do you want to cover the maturation or do you want me to either way? I, I could cover it if you want. Go for it. Um, I'm just going to be pointing while you're talking. Find a slide here. Uh, can you see it? Uh, can't see, I can't see it or wait. But yes, I can now. Okay. Um, the, an erythropoiesis um, in a healthy adult erythropoiesis, of course, as we know, it starts with the bone marrow with a pronormal blast. Um, in the pronormal blast, you see a very high NC ratio, um, more nucleus, and a very basophilic type of cytoplasm uh, uh, nucleoli is present. Um, and you'll see a dark, um, dark blue cytoplasm, except the ribosomes and the RNA. And you'll hear terms like basophilic cytoplasm, except that it's reactivity, the stain or the, the produced. Um, and the pale area um, in, in that cell um, next to the nucleus is where the Golgi body is, are, are found for lipid and protein processing. Mm -hmm. So that's the most immature. And just remember, when it comes to the immaturity of cells, you know, they're nucleated with high NC ratio, and you can see and an more prominent nucleoli. That's usually the clues that um, you would, uh, I would advise people in recognizing blast or immature cells. Um, the next in line is the basophilic normal blast. So this is the next stage after pronormal blast. Um, they're deep blue, uh, deep purple red, sorry, deep purple red clump chromatin uh, nucleoli could be possible. It's still a mitotically active cell. Uh, they're dark blue um, cytoplasm because of the ribosomes and the mRNA and hemoglobin uh, production starts here. So remember, uh, cephalic normal blast is where hemoglobin production starts. Um, still a nucleated cell. Um, deep purple red clump chromatin in the nucleus. Um, you start seeing the clumping of the chromatin or um, uh, I say clump chromatin, um, but uh, the nucleoli is still possible. So a cell's mature tool, something that you wanna note is the clumping of the chromatin, um, uh, you know, from an open, uh, open nu uh, nucle nucleoli, you can see to starting to clump and see spaces between smooth and rough chromatin. Uh, after that is the polychromatic normal blast. And if you can observe the transition during the maturation, the cells become smaller, right? So we have said from immature to immature, um, it becomes smaller. So now we have a polychromatic normal blast. Um, the nucleus is deep purple red and it's open to condensed chromatin. So one thing that we want to observe, look at the chromatin inside the cell from a smooth chromatin pronormal blast, it starts clumping and starts getting condensed. Um, and this is the last stage of the mitotic, uh, last mitotic stage of the red cells. And in the cytoplasm of that is you'll see light purple to gray blue. Um, uh, it's pink because of the increased hemoglobin production and blue still you know, because it's mitotic, that uh, there's still the, uh, from the ribosomes and the RNA. And the next stage, see, uh, with respect to size, it's smaller compared to when it started. And that's your orthochromic normal blast. Um, so you see it's smaller. See, comparing the nucleus, it's getting clumped, um, uh, getting clumped nucleus. And this is the orthochromic normal blast. And, and smaller and the nucleus is dark purple, um, condensed chromatin. So comparing it to where it started, it's more darker now. So for an open smooth chromatin, now it's darker. Um, and the nucleus is going to be started to be ejected uh, from the cell, um, light purple to pink purple uh, because of increased hemoglobin and decreased RNA and organelles in there. So if anything, um, in, in, in the peripheral blood, we'll see more of the orthochromic normal blast or what we call um, the NRBCs if we see that in peripheral blood smears. So that's an indication of um, rapid or increased demand of red cells um, 
in, in, in periphery to the liver. And, and is it useful? Yes, because there's already increased hemoglobin um, present in the cell, but the need requires them to go out, right? Um, and after uh, the nucleus is ejected uh, in this orthochromic normoblastic stage to now a polychromatic uh, erythrocyte, um, that is the anucleated stage, um, particular site as uh, what we call them. Um, if you stain them super vitally, we will see some uh, retics or RNA remnants in there. There is no nucleus in this stage, uh, and it's mostly pink, but there's still a hint of a bluish tinge to it, hence we call polychromatic. Um, and it's slowly degenerating while well, used to make the uh, red of the hemoglobin. So when you see this too, it uh, means that there is an increased demand of, um, of red cells in circulation or there's increased demand for oxygen. So always think about that when there's immaturity, um, when there's nucleated red cells or polychromasia, there's either an increased demand for oxygen or there is a rapid loss of blood. Um, and of course, the last stage is the erythrocyte, which is the mature red cell and the donut. <laughs> because uh, the donut, <laughs> because it has a unique central pallor and it's salmon pink uh, with central pallor. And, and with the mature erythrocyte, the central pallor matters uh, because that's the um, part where it, the central pallor is way too big. That's hypochromic, um, and it's uh, if there's not much of in, in there, that's also another sign of some type of disorder. So the the mature erythrocyte will, and and when we look at it later compared to the CBCs, um, will will tell us or give us clues as to what the underlying conditions possibly are. So, um, want to add to that, um, Tiffany, Aaron? Oh, no. um, I was just thinking you were doing a really great job. Oh, yeah. um, you covered so, it really well. Yeah, we were, um, last week we were talking about the stain and mm -hmm. that um, something that is basophilic um, is going to attract an acidic stain and vice versa. So um, we talked about, so if you all don't know about the stain, please go back to episode one uh, and you're going to understand why I put this in here where, you know, you have pink because of increased hemoglobin and blue from the ribosomes. And why does that matter? Make sure you understand, you know, what basophilia is versus um, eosinophilia, right? Because we're going to talk about eosinophils next week. I believe we're talking about granulocytes. And um, when you think of eosinophils, right? You think of those bright, like bright pink, orange type orange. of granules, right? Uh -huh. And so you're thinking about the eosin in the, in the hematology stain, right? So please go back and take a look at that. Um, <laughs> Carlo did an amazing job of covering amazing everything. Job. <laughs> um, I, I enjoy hearing about, um, you know, why you have, um, polychromasia. And, you know, so if you, if you see polychromasia, it means it's more of a, you know, widespread ballooning mm -hmm. to the cytoplasm. So it might even look purple. So I wanted to, um, I zoomed in on the picture in this one, uh, but I wanted to also show you how it looks compared to this beautiful smiley face of a neutrophil. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Um, Don't pick on my neutrophils. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but I want to add, um, uh, and, and also one of the, I guess, biggest advice that I would tell students or anyone listening or renewing their morphology skills is <laughs> don't stick to just memorizing what it looks like or right. don't stick to memorizing what the stage is. Right. But like what we're describing is to critique the cell and you know, knowing what the color is, what the NC ratio is, or what the chromatin looks like is what's important. Uh, because that will tell you or tell us, um, you know, what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Because think about it, 
these are living cells and you don't want to make a picture or, or memorize based on a picture. You know, remember, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to make this funny because, <laughs> you know, when you take a selfie, you look different when you're here than here. Right? or when you're here that's so true this is, that's the same thing uh right. when you take a picture you you have different you know uh angles that basically what you're looking at a smear is how you caught it in a picture that's it may right. be you know maybe you, you, they're posed differently right. <laughs> or or you know they're you know it's just don't memorize the picture but know how to critique each cell that's the right. important scale that i i i want to hone in, um, in in morphology um, and knowing that will help you identify even if it's the hardest cell. <laughs> right. I was thinking the same thing. I wanted to make sure to mention that as well, because when you're making the smear, you know, you're pulling the blood along, you know, with the other mm -hmm. slide that you're using or the spreader, whatever it is you're mm -hmm. using. And so the cells are like tumbling you know, right. or they're sliding across the glass. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know what happened with the cell. So you might have an RBC that's on its side and you're right. like, oh my gosh, it's an RBC remnant. It's a, no, it's, a it's not. <laughs> it's a sickle. It's a sickle. One piece of sickle. <laughs> yeah, it's a sickle or, you know, one something piece. like that. Yeah. And, and it's one. And you're like, oh my gosh, this person is going through yeah. this. No, you need to look at the entire look picture. Look at the entire picture, right. Right. Yeah. You need to go out to the edges of the smear to see mm -hmm. if any of the heavier cells have moved out to the edges. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, platelet clumping or blast cells. Look in the heavy area. Don't count out the heavy area because mm -hmm. a lot of times what you don't see in the normal counting area is where... You, you know, the, the heavy area is going to hold on to it. I had mm -hmm. a, I had a friend who, um, she diagnosed her own husband with a hematology disorder and, um, she went in and they could not figure out what was wrong with, you know, what he was experiencing. And she said, I'm a hematologist, please let me, and I want to see his smears. Mm -hmm. So they let her in the lab. She sat down, she went to the heavy area and she found the blast that she was, mm -hmm. that was causing um, wow. or showing the cause of the issue. And she said, look, it's right there. There weren't that many of them, but with his clinical history, what was happening, his symptoms, all of that put together and you know the rest of the cells, obviously, it made sense with his clinical picture. So then he, he's still living and doing amazing. Um, yeah. So it, it's right. all because of where you look, how you yeah. interpret. Right. Yeah. When it, when it comes to blast, um, look at the heavy one or, or the sides, the, the, the sides of the smear. Because mm -hmm. think about it. When we look at this maturation sequence, mm -hmm. the blast is the very big uh, structure and it has a huge nucleus in there. So when you make a smear, imagine or picture it as a, a heavy cell. So they will mm -hmm. drop faster. Uh, when you make a smear. So it, it'll drive, uh, drop faster at the very back. And then when you, when you push, it won't get pushed out. So, you yeah. the other so it's like a river where river. there's, they're, they're in inner tubes, right? And right. The, the heavy cell is going to go, you know, or stay behind. Yeah. I'll right? just stay here. I'll just stay here. And then the just, rest I'm of good. them are like, ah, I'm going along with the current. <laughs> so, um, very, very great, um, but it really is important to remember um, how to interpret what's happening as to, you know, how you made the smear, um, because mm -hmm. that comes into play when there's fragile cells also, right? right. And then um, also what, what's involved in the staining? What does the stain actually do? What are the pieces mm -hmm. of it? Why does it look so dark when my chromatin clumps, you know? And- mm -hmm. Chromatin, as Carlo was saying, is really, really important with all the cells. To tell myeloid versus lymphoid, you need mm -hmm. to look at the chromatin to right. look. And we have up here lookalikes. So a small lymphocyte and a plasma cell. So plasma cell is a um, antibody producing uh, B cell, right? And their their cytoplasm and the nucleus comes over to the one side of the cytoplasm could almost look like a comet sometimes, you know? And so 
we're talking about, or we have been talking about how that nucleus gets ejected. I actually made a smear and you could see right when it was ejected. It was so awesome. I showed students, I was like, look, it's just, <laughs> it's popping out, it's you know? <laughs> and they're like, that happens. I said, yeah, <laughs> this is so cool. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, you might see a plasma cell and think, oh my gosh, it's the same thing, but it's not. It could be a nucleated red cell. So you need to be sure that you're looking at how dense that chromatin is, how the cytoplasm is looking. That lymphocyte is not going to be as pink because of what Carla was saying, the um, hemoglobin is there. There's not as much uh, RNA anymore, you know, and so we have more of the constituents in the cytoplasm of the, um, of the lymphocyte because it's actively making proteins. It's actively making those antibody um, immunoglobulins, which are proteins, right? So right. it's going to be active and it's going to be staining that deeper blue. So just make sure you're aware of that. So I did skip ahead with the lookalikes. Um, Looking at the automated CBC versus the smear review, um, we have, I, I tried to break down what of the automated CBC is going to relate just to the red cells. And so you've got um, this analyzer that you stick a whole blood sample in there. It's a EDTA whole blood, so lavender top. Um, and what you're looking for is, um, you know, what are the cells that are in there, but also the components of the cells are um, what are used to identify. So you're sending light through, you know, you're looking at internal complexity um, because of how it stopped a, a current or an electrical current or how it um, made light bounce away from it. Mm -hmm. And so red cells aren't necessarily going to do that, right? Since we don't have a lot of internal components, it's that donut that you all keep <laughs> liking. It's like a window. ASCP in Boston, Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, it's, the finished pro it's the finished product, yeah. The finished product. It's a delicious thing that gives oxygen by the end. <laughs> but I always, uh, uh, one, one thing I want to add with automated CBC is um, when we when, when do the counts, um, you know, in single file, I always say, like, it's a ride to Disney, the Disney uh, ride or, or Universal, whatever, and then we're counting and we have to That's do right. files one by one. Yeah. And, and that counting is... We have two watchers, so one on the side and one in the front, and one will tell you how big you are and what co how complex you are. <laughs> um, so that's how I always see it uh, with 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 the CVC counters. Um, but you know, one of the erythropoietic cell lines is the um, the orthochromic, uh, the nucleated red blood cells. So it's important to note that those when they're when we're counting them or when the automated CVC sees them. They, um, they're most likely going to be counted as a WBC because of the internal structures, right? They, the, the automated CBC would, would, would not recognize that as an immature red cell. It will flag it um, as, as you need to review this because there's a lot of these things, um, but, but that's a trigger that we, um, we will review them. So in the automated CBC, um, one thing to note is that um, you know a lot of NRBCs will will be counted as a WBC. So we have to correct if there's a correction factor if there's more than five NRBCs found um, in the smear. Um, it, it, once we get to, to the abnormalities, you'll find that um, automated CBCs will be affected as well um, based on the dis underlying disorder. So um, you, you know, you have to recognize them and, but knowing the normal sequence, their function, then you can understand what's, um, how the abnormal process is and how to effectively result a CBC. So. Absolutely. So even though we're talking about just the red cells today, we can't really leave out the rest of it right. because they all mm -hmm. go in together. Yeah. So we've got nucleated red cells can be counted as white, so could platelet clumps. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing a, 
increase in white cell count, but then you're seeing um, a correlating low RBC count or low platelet count, you're thinking, okay, I either have a clot or I have nucleated red cells. We need a smear review. So that's why we do smear reviews is to be like, okay, well, we're not going to just um, blindly go along with what this instrument says. We need to actually visualize it. So you do need to be able to um, know your morphology and know the distinction using um, these steps that we have been giving you. Yeah, exactly. There's always going to be a need for that medical laboratory scientist there to, to recognize um, anything abnormal or just to know the normal. So we're, we're always going to be needed no matter how much automation there is. Absolutely. Uh, automation the ones... is good. <laughs> automation is good, but it's not always perfect. And it requires that, you know, that human skill that we have. Um, to help with the interpretation. Exactly. Absolutely. And as we were talking about before, a lot of people that actually make the analyzers have been laboratorians because they're like, oh, I wish I had a machine that would help me do this yeah. thing faster. Right. And mm -hmm. so we, be, we got automated uh, analyzers because of people working on the bench saying, hey, I need this. I need help with this. This mm -hmm. is how it could make it. This is how it could reliably say this. But as they were saying, we're not trained monkeys, right? right. You can't pull somebody off the road and say, hey, press this button and release these results. Because mm -hmm. if you did, we would, not, we would not have as many people in the population as we do, because there would be a lot of medical mixed diagnosis. There would be a lot of treatment mistakes. It would not be safe uh, to go to the hospital anymore. So we are in a manpower shortage, meaning that we have a very staggering lack of people in our profession and we don't just take anybody. You have yeah. to be certified. You have to have the appropriate continuing edu educations in order to maintain your certification. You mm -hmm. need to consistently prove that you have the skills to be able to work there. And, um, you know, the patient's diagnosis rests on you. And, right. so, you know, we have- yeah, Thank you. I was gonna say thank you both to both of you guys. You're both program directors. So you're part of the solution. You're getting those professionals out there. So that's worth mentioning that you guys are doing a great job getting our new aspiring students that are hopefully listening out there and making that change. Thank right. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you want to, um, you know, you can see Carlo and I have been very passionate about what we've been talking about. Yeah. And it's, he is so right. Um, I did want to go into DCLS as well. Um, but I was thinking about my trajectory might be a little bit different. So I have decided what I want my doctor to be. But the thing about it is, is you all have established specialties, right? And as Carlo was saying, every time that I start talking about something else, like a different topic, I'm like, oh, that's my favorite. And then I talk about right. another one, I'm like, oh, that's my favorite. And then I yeah. keep talking and I'm like, oh, they're all my favorite. I can't, right. I can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I was saying, um, and, you know, my professors could know um, that each semester it, it renews my passion in, in medical lab science, you know, not because I'm, I'm specialist in heme that, you know, that's my life, I, I, but what DCLS has, uh, going through the DCLS program or being in the DCLS program has renewed my passion to not just understanding the superficial level, but you know, deeper path in the path understanding the pathology of diseases, mm -hmm. but also how it impacts the healthcare system. And, um, and what's funny about it to me is, yes, I've understood and you know, learning all the science, but translating it to information that others can mm -hmm. understand to me sometimes it's this a struggle um you know like i can't tell someone like hey you, you, you're missing one beta chain okay <laughs> what, does <laughs> <They're that> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what does that mean you know um it's it's you know that's 
part of that is for me is understanding and collaborating with doctors um, uh, on, on understanding these tests. But at the end of the day, CBC will tell us a lot of, um, um, of especially with, with red cells or, or any infections or systemic um, even, is, is a big, uh, would give a big clue to a clinician, you know, trigger other tests to be ordered, so. Well, we have, um, I wanna see if Aaron has anything to say about this, but um, I was moving into the idea that there has been legislation that has been proposed about allowing people who are not certified like nurse, nurses to do laboratory testing more extensively. And um, we have actively been on Capitol Hill absolutely saying no, um, because you know we're not saying that nurses are not smart. That's not what we're saying. It's not their specialty. This no. is our specialty. It's, and it's we training. have a profession just for this. Why? Why would you try to get rid of that. So you all, when you come in and you become active into our professional organizations like ASCP, ASCLS, um, and there are others that stem, you know, from those, you need to stand up and be counted like a CBC. You need to be in there. You need to spread um, you know, knowledge, and you need to put it in a way, as Carlo was saying, that people can understand, okay? You need to think about who your audience is. That's what we're trying to do today. We're trying mm -hmm. to think about who our audience is and, you know, speak to that audience in a way that they can understand. Do you have mm -hmm. something to say about that, Aaron? Oh, I would just say, um, just with any profession, so it, we have specialized training. Um, you wouldn't want me on the floor as a nurse doling out medication. Um, just like you don't want somebody that ha doesn't have the training and the experience to actually do um, a differential or read a microculture, right. distribute blood. So um, there are groups. Um, both ACP, ACLS, AMT, they're all advocating for um, our professions, for our licensure. So all those memberships dues you're paying um, fund people that are on Capitol Hill fighting legislation state at state level, county level, national level to make sure that we're being heard. So um, make sure to be a part of those memberships because you're not only getting the mentorship, but you're also helping to push the profession forward. So, right. and um, one one important thing to add, I guess you know when when you see emails about call for action, um, uh, hopefully um, if you see those that you help respond and you know just your simple logging in, you don't have to be. Um, out there promoting or, or um, being the speaker of an event, simple things like that would help, um, you know, responding to call of action or, you know, sending an e a email to your legislator, legislator would make an impact. Um, but Tiffany, I, I'm sure you could, um, uh, uh, I guess, agree to this, that in the education world, um, one thing that's, I guess, changing is the emphasis on interprofessional uh, mm -hmm education um, so that we all recognize what our roles are what we're doing um, and eventually you know you know we are leaning on the expertise of our different disciplines so absolutely and I think it's about yeah. darn time too I've been, yeah. <laughs> I've, been, <laughs> I've been leading the charge um, at our institution about interprofessional education um, especially involving the lab um, because it never has really been done before and, you know, there may be um, some interprofessional talk, but if you don't put the lab in there, then you are missing a huge opportunity to get it right. Because mm -hmm. if you are not, so we're talking cell bowl like it's football. If you don't have your entire team, how do you expect to win a game, right? You need to make sure that all the appropriate people in that diagnostic care of the patient have a seat at the table because that's how DCLS actually was, had come about because pathologists are extremely busy, right? And they are our physicians within the lab. And then you have the physicians on the floor, everybody's overwhelmed. And 
there are not enough pathologists to go around to say, hey, with this case, you need to start looking at this. Let's have some conversations. Let's talk about it. Um, so the DCLS is there to mitigate all of that and mm -hmm. to work with both, right? right? So, yeah. yeah, so essentially, you know, the role is not to replace pathologists. No. The, the role is never to replace. Their, they're no. valuable and they're needed. Their medical expertise are needed. But the role of DCLS as an advanced practitioner is to advocate for the appropriate use of tests. Um, you know, not just, you know, yes, the, I, I have great deference for doctors or for medical doctors, but mm -hmm. there are some times when they order things that are not appropriate, <laughs> um, you know, or- I have something to, to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> but but what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, we, I guess, voice of reason uh, for appropriateness of tests, because not because the test is available, that you should get it <laughs> because there's consequences, you know, systemic about that. Like, what if you find it? What are you going to do about it? Or, um, you know, or, or who's paying for it? Is it covered? Not covered. But knowing the appropriate test and following, um, you know, clinical presentation uh, and using evidence-based guidelines, then we can be effective in, in, in the whole quality of care is, is, is my, you know, my mantra about that. I really what, wanted what to it? say that it was just that lab doesn't make it easy for physicians to know what to order because we have mm -hmm. so many different kind of variations of True. similar tests and we name them all these different things and use all these different acronyms. We do not make it easy for people yeah. to know what it is that they need to order. So having someone who is like, oh yeah, you know, we've got this. I know it looks weird. I know that we have this other one, but this is exactly what's being addressed with this test instead mm -hmm. of this one. Uh, you know, because you could be just out of med school, right? And you could have already seen all these different tests that have just come out and everything. But, you know, we're like, or DCLS are like the linguistic experts <laughs> that speak both sides, you know, they're, they're our translator, if you right? <laughs> translator, exactly. So um, yeah, nothing against physicians, nothing at all, nothing against yeah. any of our team members. Everybody has a different focus. Everybody relies on one another. What bothers me is when we are in education and the people that are teaching our students are too short-sighted to sit there and accurately represent the contributions of the other team members. And it is okay if you say that you don't know what they do, but it makes a difference as what you do with that. So if you need to have someone else come in who is the expert in that field, have them come in and have a conversation. Don't sit there and try to pose as someone that you're not or in a position you have never been in because you're going to spread inaccurate information. You're gonna possibly spread some um, misconceptions about the profession. And I think that unfortunately, we're all trying to struggle to overcome that in this day and age because the community, the grand community out in the world does not understand the difference between a nurse and a laboratorian. They don't understand the difference between a nurse and a doctor. They don't understand the nurse, um, the difference between a nurse and a uh, pharmacist or a physician and a pharmacist or a radiologist and a nurse, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I've even seen right. children's books like um, I'm not going to throw this author under the bus, but they they said that the nurse is doing the X-ray. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, I feel like your this conversation has even led us to a future med lab lady Gill yes. actual discussion because <laughs> we could go for like an hour or two. Just Are we gonna, we're going to go to a podcast now. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, we need to rein it back, but I, I want, I tell my students this oh, kind I know. of stuff it's important. because they need to know, you know, we, we are so misunderstood because we have sat down and took it. 
because we're like, I just need to get, make sure that the patient's taken care of. And then we just, you know, zone out everything else. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. We are a very young profession. We're kind of like the new kid on the block because we've only been around Mm -hmm. since like the twenties in mass. You know, Mm -hmm. we started in the late 1800s, only really got going in the early 1900s. That is not that long, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it is very easy to overlook we're kind of at that pro normal blast point in yeah. our profession. Yeah, pro normal the basophilic normal blast. There ready to release. Go. We're now we're ready to release. Into <laughs> okay, we're ready to go. <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> we're ready to release that nucleus. We're ready to review that there. smear and see what's That's going. That's right. <laughs> All right. So, going back um, to that. <laughs> going, going back, back to, red to why we're here. <laughs> going um, back to red cells. <laughs> We're going to take a look at the smear review and the automated CVC. So the RVCs are counted. Their um, their size is uh, evaluated. Their internal complexity is evaluated, just like all the other cells that run through the machine. And then um, the specific parts about those automated results would be the indices, which are calculated, um, the MCV, which is the mean corpuscular volume, the MCH, the mean corpuscular um, hemoglobin. So when we say corpuscular, we mean cell, right? Mm-hmm. And then the uh, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, which would be MCHC. So um, I know I didn't write those all out. I was just trying to, you know, save space. Um, and then, uh, along with that, you've got the H and H was, which is hemoglobin and hematocrit. And you're using those to calculate those, um, those indices. And then you have the actual red cell count. So when we look at the smear review, as, um, we've all been saying, you're looking at the physical characteristics of the cells themselves, how they have interacted with the stain and what they look like compared to other cells as well, because you can judge size of the RBC looking at other cells like the nucleus of a small lymphocyte, okay? Um, And knowing the various ranges of sizing of WBCs would help you as well. So looking at the smear reviews, uh, RBC morphology in particular, Uh, the hemoglobin is going to uh, be a great indication of the healthiness of the cell, right? And the healthiness of the patient to begin with. Um, So this is not going to turn into a rant, but I do want to, (laughs) (laughs) I do want to state that um, the cure for anemia is not only uh, red cell transfusions. Okay. You have to know the reason um, for why is this person anemic? So the general populace has uh, a very high concern about iron deficiency anemia, right? Wherein a, you know, a very um, developed country, we don't really have that issue, right? So um, when we look at iron um, deficiency, we end up seeing this greater central power like Carlo was talking about that we don't always have that nice little circle. It can be really large and that's showing lack of hemoglobin production, right? Mm -hmm. And so that could be because of what the patient is eating. So if we see that as the problem, then the problems um, treatment would be to have them take in more iron right? So it's Mm -hmm. not always going to be, if you have anemia, no matter what you give red cells, we have become very much better at utilizing the blood supply. Um, That doesn't mean don't donate. That just means that we are doing a better job of using what we have to effectively treat the patient. So if you are seeing that the patient is having trouble um, with like megalobastic anemia where, you know, vitamin B12 or intrinsic factor is an issue, um, you end up giving that to them instead of a packed red cell unit. Okay. So, mm-hmm. um, I just want to make sure that we cover that. So looking right. at your, um, looking at your smear review, you should be able to see what the cell looks like and couple that with what your automated CBC right. told you. Okay. Yes. So how oh. the, Go ahead. 
uh, oh, I, I always say, um, look at the indices as a clue, um, as a clue and at least give you an idea of what you're looking at. Um, you know, we can start with MCV, um, you know, at MCV is between 80 to 100. So I, this is how I remember MCV. <laughs> MCV, the normal, normal is 80 to 100. That's the normal grade that you want to get. But if you're underachieved that, <laughs> You, you become, you feel small, you're a microsite. <laughs> but if you go over that, you become big, and you're macrosite. <laughs> that's how I remember MCV. <laughs> um, but that tells you a lot of information already based on the size, um, microsites um, or ma uh, macrosites. So my, my first, when you review, when you review smears, um, you know, as, as someone as you know, entry level or just beginning, you become nervous about looking smears, Look at your CBC results. Uh, CBC results will tell you a lot. Um, starting with the MCV and the MCHC or MCH, whichever you prefer. Um, but I, I always say MCV and MCHC. Um, those are the two important things for me because that could drive you to the extremes, which is the micro and the macro. Um, right? You know, those both ends tell you nutritional def deficiencies. Iron, smaller. B12 folate, bigger, and everything else in the middle. Ask, and then you can ask a, a follow-up questions after that. Um, and the central pallor or the you know big donut holes, <laughs> it depends on where you go. Uh, the donut holes will tell you a lot too. Um, if if it's spherocytic, um, you know the MCHC will be higher. Um, or that also will tell you if the MCHC is higher, the quality of your specimen. If, if it's greater than 36.5, could be hemolyzed um, or um, uh, lipemic, um, or maybe it's a clue that you're about to see a smear from a multiple myeloma patients, uh, patient. So those indices help a lot. And um, one thing that I was going to hone in on, <laughs> or at least I've recently found out and I'm obsessing with it, <laughs> is the value of RDW. I didn't even, oh, yeah. you know, that's yeah. one of the things that people take take uh, for granted for is the RDW mm -hmm. that tells us in esocytosis um, mm -hmm. or the variation in cell size. Mm -hmm. But also, um, there are a lot of studies out there that could, it's uh, used as a prognostic indicator for something. So that's that's very very important um, to report. Um, yeah, I anything? almost put it on here um, oh. in more ways than I did. Um, but I didn't cause I was trying to keep it very concise, but yeah, I love the RDW. <laughs> but it worked out. Carlo just knew. <laughs> That's right. He did. He, he can sense these things. He's very good um, about that. Yeah. <laughs> <I understand. laughs> you really do. Um, so yeah, we've got, um, we've got all these different, uh, ways that you can take what you see and correlate it with what is on the CBC. And I find that students really, that is their hardest thing to do. But once they get it and realize mm -hmm. that it's not as hard as it may seem, then they mm -hmm. love it, right? right? Yeah, so- um, So you said so it's a cheat sheet, <laughs> so yes, you know what you're about to see. <laughs> it, it really is. And so if you can't correlate what the picture looks like with what you saw in the automated results, then something's wrong there. You know, um, either you made a mistake, like you looked at the wrong person or um, you don't know what you're doing and you need to go eat because you need a little more donuts. <laughs> <laughs> you need to rest, you close your eyes for a second. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, and don't be afraid to ask your bench mate for help of right. you know what it is. Um, so, so yeah absolutely so you're clues. looking there's always clues <laughs> there's always clues so you're looking at um hemoglobin you're looking at the di distribution and amount of it within the cell and then you're looking at how many um red cells look the same essentially with that so he was talking about the mchc the mean the mean stands for average so students forget that a lot. It's average. It's not all, okay? So just because you have one big one over here and one little one over here, and the rest of them are in the normocytic 
type of um, scenario, your MCHC is not really going to be affected too much, right? Because it's mm -hmm. the mean, it's an average. Right. So statistics, ladies and gentlemen, your <laughs> average score, All about lab, the statistics. Lab, 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 <laughs> your <laughs> average <laughs> score is the same thing as the MCHC of what's <laughs> happening here. How was like that, Aaron? Let's see what I you did there. <laughs> Always thinking that one. <laughs> <laughs> Can I steal your idea? <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, Just borrowing. Yeah. I, I don't remember you saying that one, but um, yeah, I picked it up. So the, um, the size of the RBC is also, again, with the RDW and um, the MCV is what you're thinking about because mean corpuscular volume is how much liquid, essentially, what's inside of it, how much of um, contents are in the, you know, the sack of the red cell, essentially. So it's like a, a balloon, how much did you fill it with? And then um, the amount of red cells in the blood would obviously be the red cell count. But also when you think about the hematocrit, yes, we analyze it and it's a, it's a component that's shown on the CVC. But if you look at the, if you look at the tube, um, of any of the uh, specimens that were collected at the same time as the lavender top tube, you can see the portion of the red cells that are in the blood versus plasma. And that's your hematocrit, right? Your hematocrit is just how much of the blood are the cells, right? The red cells. So, um, and then um, it's just talking about where do you actually uh, look at these things? So it's, you just want to make sure you're, you've looked at all the locations of the smear review first, right? You do your, your scan and get the feel of what this patient's going through. And then you go and start doing your counts of whatever it is that you're counting. Um, so if it's like white blood cells or you're, you know, whatever, um, you're going to be looking at a place in the smear that is between the feathered edge and the thick area. So it's like this beautiful sweet spot um, where the red cells are near each other, but they're not on top of each other like this. So if you see Rouleau, most likely you're too thick. If you've, um, if you've seen uh, it, where there's like clumps of them and they're like sitting weird, you're probably too far close to the feathered edge. All right. You want to get to the point where they're like sitting next to each other. And mm -hmm. sometimes there might be a little overlap, like, Hey, mm -hmm. you're my friend. You Let me hug you, you know, but they're <laughs> not always like this. And it's not yeah. like that. So you there's want, a good hug and a bad hug. Okay. There's a good hug and a bad hug. <laughs> if too many people but are I hugging. digress. And, um, yeah. So, too many hugs, you can't go there. No. So <laughs> Tiffany, um, so we put all of this together and it, how does it help us? What do you mean, how does it help us? Um, like, does it lead us to different anemias? You just uh, trying to move me along. I'm getting excited. It was a segue. I was spot. trying to be yeah. clever and do a you nice, a cool segue for you. <laughs> but you, I'm just saying here. I, I didn't want to like, too much. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> you did that to me last week. You I totally all these forgot fun about facts, this. And I was like, okay, so what do I, what do I do with so. all these fun facts that I've learned? <laughs> how will they help my patient? You can tell me yes. more stuff. I want to. I, how do I help them? You are absolutely right. So here we're talking about anemia. Um, I know that we've already talked about it. Um, I put it towards the end because, you know, you don't know what's happening with the patient till you look at the stuff. So really that's the end for you. And so I wanted to put that at the end. It's the application of what it is that you're talking yeah. about, just like Aaron was saying. I figured it was the big picture. It is, it is. Why is it picture. important to know all this stuff? Because well, it tells you all this stuff over here. It really so. does. So looking at what your cell, your red cells look like, because that's what we're focusing on, can really indicate to you, is it a bone marrow problem? Is it a problem with um, what the patient is consuming or doing? Is it an inherited issue? Um, we can team up with molecular to find that out. Um, so it used to be where when we were talking about leukemias, which can affect the red cell line, 
right? Because it can push, as you were saying, the, the <laughs> islands out to the side, right? Um, teardrops, yep. Um, <laughs> that uh, they could be affected because of a, a leukemia, which can be inherited. It could be caused by some type of drug exposure of some kind of thing um, that would cause a problem. Um, so when we do see increased destruction of RBCs, we do call it a hemolytic anemia. And there are reasons for that right there. I'll, I'll use my pointer right here. Um, Carlo, do you have anything to wrap us up with anemia or anemia. anything okay. like that? So um, I guess points uh, from a laboratory and the techniques that I would always think of think of is recognizing your indices, you know, knowing what's mac no microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic. Remember with that, think about the grade that you want to get in school <laughs> between 80 to 100, that's normal city. If you go below that, you feel small, you're microcytic. If you go over 100, you feel big, you're macrocytic. So feel sorry for our C students right now. Uh <laughs> no, 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 no. But that's the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. We're overachievers here. <laughs> Educational goal, right? Overachievers. No, but that's, that's a one way to remember it. But um, one way to remember that. But one thing um, with that is knowing the, you know, translating we've talked about the normals and we've talked about the principles of automation so recognizing like for example you have a uh, low red cell like it says zero and then you have a high hemoglobin and then like what is going on it says zero but i have hemoglobin it doesn't make any sense right mm -hmm. so that triggers that probably is a cold agglutinin where it's all clumped when it's a one big cell and it's counted in one in when they pass as a single file they're all counted together right? The Disney guy didn't count them separate, <laughs> all one. Um, but that's one way to, do, to think about it uh, and learning um, to do that. So in the indices wait, part... Oh, wait, wait, wait. So for blood banking, that would mean reactivity in your immediate spin phase. Immediate okay, go spin. ahead. <laughs> Tying it all together. Right? IGM. <laughs> yeah, IGM. Woo! <laughs> um, and then that's another thing. Is with that, you look at your MCHC. So MCHC will help you determine if it's hypochromic um, or uh, if it's greater than 36.5. In some places, they call it 37. Either you know, it's pre-analytic, whether it's hemolyzed, lipemic, um, or um, patients with high protein, because that will increase MCHCs. Um, or maybe it's a disease that has resistant hemoglobins, like sickle cells or hereditary spherocytosis or maybe it's immune mediated. And that will prepare your brain. So when you go under the scope, you can see and at least have a clue of what you're going to look at on the morphology. But one thing about morphology is that because you know, you don't call it, <laughs> you have to make sense of it, right? But imagine like, like what we have said earlier, we are holding the hand of the doctor and leading them to the right decision to make. Mm -hmm. If you call microcytes, macrocytes, spherocytes, you know, we all know those are important things, but if you keep calling them, like, what are we going to do now, right? So um, it, it's important to make sense of your final report to determine and lead them to the right diagnosis. Because if you find spherocytes, think destruction of red cells, because that means there's no central pallor, there's no donut. I don't have donuts. I'm destroyed. Yeah, like donuts too, yes. I'm destroyed. <laughs> I don't, don't have donuts. Don't destroy the donuts, Carlo. <laughs> um, if you have uh, small cells, iron or blood loss. Um, and if you have big macrocytic cells, um, those are, you know, the B12 deficiencies. You know, you know, 80 to 100, right? Macro, big. But deficiencies with that, it's B12 deficiencies. Now, think about that as the... You know, monster energy drinks, monster big, <laughs> um, this B12, right? Uh, or B complex drinks. <laughs> um, but, the, you know, when it comes to the different shapes of cells, when you do smear reviews, you know, spirocytes, those are important because that will tell us destruction. I mean, what's destruction? Hemolysis. Um, and that will tell the doctor, figure, uh, you know, not, not figure this out, but like we need to know what's going, what's going on, why these cells are hemolyzing. 
Um, but another important thing is the schistocytes. The schistocytes uh, in a smear review is very, very important. But when you see schistocytes, you want to correlate it to what's around the smear. Like if, if there's low platelets uh, there, because um, that tells us either microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or there's uh, um, like blood clots or uh, intravascular destructions of cells or mechanical destructions of cells. But you have to see them everywhere to make mm -hmm. correlate, correlate your, your report. Uh, and you do your all, all your due diligence um, when it comes to that, because that's one of the things that clinicians will, will look at. Um, is if you report schistocytes, do I have platelets? Now I have to need, I have to find a coagulation study um, if, if it really truly is a DIC or, or maybe EHEC or for Aaron, <laughs> Aaron uh, maybe it's an EHEC infection um, because those are really important. Um, I like to think of it uh, when, when I see schistocytes at blood clots, right? Um, I think of it as there's a car in the middle of the highway that's stalled and yeah. everyone is just moving. And yeah. then when it, when it slashed, and, like, oh. and, you know, it moves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it slashes because that's how yeah. schistocytes yeah. look like. It's, uh, it's, it's a mechanical destruction of the red cell. And, and that will tell you, um, uh, clues that there's a blood clot somewhere, but you have to make sense of that report. So, um, and then another thing about red cell morphology is the structures, you know, um, and if it's a hereditary, you know, structural defect with whether it's a cytoskeleton or a, a defect in, 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 in the structures per se, those are always uniform. You will see them in the entire smear, like ovalocytes, elliptocytes, stomatocytes, spherocytes. Those are everywhere. Um, you know, uniform because it's a clonal or genetic defect, um, and not just randomly seeing. If you find a piece of elliptocyte, that's not hereditary elliptocytosis <laughs> because everything else is normal, but a yeah. piece <laughs> of it is there. <laughs> or uh, stomatocyte, like I. I I always say that, like I said, goat eye. Is that, is that, does that make sense to you? I, I always think of it that like a slit, goat eye. Oh. I, I think of it that way. Um, but, <laughs> that's but it's everywhere. It's like looking at you, staring at you, but it's everywhere. You just don't want to call it all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, because now that you find that and you've heard about stomatocytes, every time you see it, you call it. Don't. <laughs> you have to make, the important thing is you have to make sense of the report because that, that translates to what the doctor will decide on how to a approach uh, the treatment or how to assess the progress of a treatment. Um, you know, if, if a patient who is in stem cell transplant still, or preparing them for stem cell transplant will still see teardrops, that's bad, right? Mm -hmm. Or if a perfectly healthy 18 year old kid um, has schistocytes, that's bad, right? Um, so, you know, it tells us the information that we give clinicians is vital. And, and that's, and knowing how to relay that um, is, is something that, we need to understand. So, but morphology skills is, does not happen overnight. But what my biggest advice is know your indices, 80 to 100, <laughs> greater than 36.5, know your indices, and that prepares you to what you're going to look at the smear. If it's all the same, clonal, hereditary, um, schistocyte, bad, teardrops, bad. Sphere sites bad. <laughs> Those are, you know, the clues that I always, I always tell people. Um, and then if there's, if the, if the red cells have a lot of inclusions in there, uh, that's another clue that they don't have a spleen. No one's because we have talked about earlier the car wash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eating. <laughs> airport, airport security. That's if, right. If, if, yeah. If it's going out there freely, they're they don't have security anymore. <laughs> um, right. So, what does that mean? Maybe they have a disorder that, uh, or something happened that that took their spleen out. Um, so, you know, some things that you wanna you know take a look at. Um, use the indices, match it with your morphology. So, can you? I know that we've gone for a long time, but I would like you to talk about pyroquiclocytosis. Can you 
do I something say, really I, I say, so pyro poikilo is for me um like a, a firestorm of, of mm -hmm. things um uh what what i compare it to um if you uh, i always say because i've seen in my my entire career I've only seen, I've only seen one <laughs> um one case that was preserved uh, not preserved but one case was one patient that's known but pyropoikilo is hereditary so it means it's going to happen hereditary pyropoikilo but it looks like a blood was subjected to an extreme temperature so if you want to see it you can simulate um, but I guess it's getting to fall now. So, but you know, you know how um, some uh, some places they have the the drop box of the lab outside the door in the middle of a summer. <laughs> you put the blood in there. I, I, I say this because I worked in a reference lab and I've seen a lot of them. <laughs> you know, like this blood is cooked, <laughs> so like, it's not possible to have twenty five patients. <laughs> <laughs> with the same smear of hereditary pyropoikilocytosis. <laughs> you know, like, oh my goodness. But delivery like is very important. How you deliver the lab specimens yeah. is very important. So pre adolytic factors is important, yes. right? So, you know, when you see these types of stuff, um, when the smear looks like there's schistocytes, there's burr cells, there's um, a lot of schistocytes, spherocytes, um, elliptocytes. That's because it's a hereditary condition that looks like they're on fire or they're boiling the blood. Um, and, and, and that, um, when you see those kind of things, think of two things. When was it collected and where was it collected? How old are they and do they have previous results? You know, like few previous results and where, uh, when was this collected? So those are the things that you need to think about. Because like we've said or honed in earlier, um, uh, you know, you need to make sense of your report by marrying pre-analytic with analytic so you can have post-analytic reports that are good. Well, thank you. I, I, love, I love it when um, we talk about that because it's, it's a very student-centered uh, question, you know, um, yeah. pyropoiclocytosis. Mm -hmm. They're like, whoa. And so it's really neat. It's <laughs> really neat to hear you talking about it. Thank yeah. you. We got to talk a little pre-analytics too, which are important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. QA but is any so important. Any hematology conversation or <laughs> any lab conversation. But uh, one oh. uh, one uh, one smear I want to share is I, I shared a smear of, of a the control slides. I, I made a smear of the control slides and stained it, and I made it case study behind it. It was a case of a 25-year-old lady uh, who is seasonal traveler from South America to, and North America, depending on, uh, on cold months, <laughs> but it's all nucleated cells or nucleated red cells because mm. the controls are avian blood. <laughs> I did not know that. And avian blood are nucleated blood. <laughs> so it's like, what is going on? Everything has an eye. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, like, oh, well, maybe you don't know. You may be able to get a vet sample one of these days. <laughs> yeah, um, we actually do get um, zoo specimens um, at, at Baptist for the Jacksonville Zoo. So um, some oh, of the wow. CBC said they'll do down there on like tigers. Whoa. Yeah, I haven't gotten to do one, but I've gotten micro zoo specimens, but. Whoa. Yeah. So you never know well, when you'll need those never bird know. skills. <laughs> you never know. I'm but, yeah. sitting there thinking, I don't think I'm preparing my students well enough. We've never <laughs> talked about tiger, <laughs> tiger blood cells. <laughs> tiger but, but yeah, so it's kind of cool. It's just like, you're yeah. tricking us again. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Keeping yes. On your toes in the cell bowl. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Toss that in. Dodge and Toss weave that. and. Toss that in. <laughs> all right see those, see those seconds go up <laughs> you see go? diff but that's yeah. not really hematology <laughs> uh, no <laughs> don't just oh. Oh. yes oh we selfies. have on. got oh. some beautiful selfies here Woo all right so we do have more that were submitted um however if you are submitting selfies, please make sure that the link to your 
um, OneDrive or Google Drive is Terrible. accessible <laughs> to me. <laughs> Because if you don't make it so that anyone with the link can view your picture, then your picture won't show up here. <laughs> so we did have several more uh, submissions. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to uh, get them to work because I did not have access. So um, please make sure that you do and um, make sure that anyone with the link can access whatever it is that you're submitting. So from what we have here, We've got the ladies back from Kansas. All right, last week, I apologize. I couldn't remember where you all were from, but um, we have added one more person in there. Welcome to the Kansas team, at least the picture. Um, we've got Kansas, we've got West Virginia that were number one last week and they look like a beautiful sea of blue um, and more members came in today. Uh, we've got this gentleman out here from California. He was very, uh, he did a very good job with his uh, score. And then we have these uh, team members from Nebraska. And uh, they are the only ones posing in front of the uh, selfie guy. I love it. He's everywhere. It's almost like Flat Stanley. Uh, <laughs> and it's a spirit this, thing. It's a spirit yeah. thing. <laughs> This, um, this is a picture from um, my students because uh, I was trying to just round out what we've got going on here. So we've got Kansas, Maryland, West Virginia, Nebraska, California, back to you, Paul, Weber State. Here, I, I put a different uh, frame around Weber because they are leading the charge again this week. So great job to you. Awesome. And is, is there a red if, blood cell in the middle of that all that blue from West Virginia? Oh, I didn't. Mm. Look at I didn't that. Anybody was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, what was it. happening here? Like, <laughs> <laughs> she that looks like a low count of red oh. cell. <laughs> yeah, she has a, a face like, oh, <laughs> um, but it does. It looks like a sea of blue and then a red cell mm -hmm. right red. in the middle. So that was mm -hmm. cute. An inclusion, All right. an inclusion, see? An inclusion, <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so, Carlo, it was so wonderful having you yeah. on the show. Thank you, week. thank you, thank you for you inviting me. You are a gem. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I could listen to you talk all day. <laughs> me too. And, We're gonna um, get donuts now. Yes, yeah. <laughs> If anybody, um, we were not we were not promoting the Donut Connection or Duncan this week, uh, but they may choose to come in and <laughs> sponsor us. Next sponsor time. the medical. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, keep doing an amazing job with what you're doing. As you can see, um, everybody is really having a good time. I'm getting a lot of feedback from. Uh, program directors and students who are submitting to the international uh, cell bowl as well uh, with thank yous and how much they're enjoying it. So we are enjoying it too. And we're so thankful you're participating. So keep doing a great job and keep uh, doing those selfies and sending them in. Anybody else have anything to say? Um, and if you take photos, make sure you have the hashtag cell bowl 2021. A bowl. Keep doing your differentials. Keep that cell vision alive. That's right. And um, we look to see you next time. So check out episode three um, after week three. So everybody uh, have a great week and get out there and sell bowl. Hey. <laughs> everybody sell bowl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.